So for today's video, we are going to discuss wig making. So one of the hardest things about working in the wig and makeup design industry is sometimes trying to create wigs and facial hair pieces that look as realistic as possible. Um, there's certainly going to be some instances where it doesn't necessarily matter how realistic something looks, um, but uh, most of the times, directors and designers are going to be wanting you to create things that look like um, actual facial hair or actual hair on people. Um, and in order to do this, a lot of times we end up having to create our own pieces for that. Um, and that is where the whole process of wig making comes in. So wig making is done um, in order to either create like an entirely new hair piece or an entirely new wig. Sometimes you're just adding a front onto something. Um, if we are fronting something, that is basically just meaning that we're adding in a new hairline because whatever hairline was there was not realistic looking before. Um, an example of that would be um, this wig right here that I worked on. Um, so it's a little tricky to see because it is kind of like a smaller front that I made, but basically like this entire like section right here I put all of that in I took off the old front that was on it um, just because it didn't look very realistic and it needed to be a style um, that I was able to kind of pull back a little bit like this so that you would be able to see some of the hair on it um, so in order to make this look more realistic and to even just like fit my actress better because this is completely customized um, to one very specific person's head um, I decided to front it and by doing that, I added in a hairline that when this is worn, it looks a lot more natural than if it was all just completely straight um, as it was before I did that. Um, so how do you even do something like that? So to do something like that, uh, you have to ventilate. So ventilating is basically just taking pieces of hair and you are tying tiny knots with a tiny needle. And from this, you can create fronts like this, you can create facial hair pieces, you can create entire wigs. Um, eyebrows really anything I've seen people make like chest hair you could really do like anything with it um, sometimes ventilating is referred to as hand tying or knotting it just kind of depends I feel like um, on who you're talking to I was always taught um, like the word ventilating but then I worked places where they only refer to it as knotting um, so it kind of just depends on who you're talking to but if you are going to get into the wig and makeup design industry it is certainly something um, that is a good thing for you to know even if you really are more um, into like the makeup side of things. You don't necessarily want to work in theater. A lot of it is so useful for you in film um, and it can really just help you make things look a lot more realistic. Um, even if you're like a special effects artist or something, you might have to be making lace pieces um, to go on to like prosthetics or things. Um, so it's kind of a good skill to learn if you are able to. Um, it can definitely be a little bit tricky when you're first learning how to do it. Um, I always tell people whenever they're talking to me about it, when I first learned how to do it, um, I definitely cried. I could not understand it at all. It took me a long time. Um, but once I got the hang of it, it is something that I do really enjoy now. Um, so if you think it's something that you might like, or if you are really interested in this industry, um, if you try it the first couple times and you absolutely hate it, um, just keep trying to do it because you might not hate it the more that you do it. It just is one of those things that um, until it clicks, sometimes it just really doesn't make sense. Um, so in order to get started, if you do want to do ventilating, there's like a couple of basic things that you might need for that. Um, so your first thing that you're really going to need um, would be your ventilating needle, right? Um, so these needles, this can be a little bit hard to see, but I do have one. So this is like, um, you can't even really see it. In here, there's a tiny little needle that you can't see, um, but basically they come loose um, and they have like these little like fish hooks essentially on them like it's like a little barb and that's what's going to catch the hair um, these needles come in a range of sizes and basically what these sizes mean is how many hairs it can pick up so if you have a size 2 needle you are only supposed to be able to pick up 2 hairs with it versus if I have a 7 um, technically I can pick up 7 hairs with it um, really all that means is there's going to be some needles that are more appropriate for like really fine hair work like in the front um, like with what I just showed in the beginning where you're only going to be using like one piece of hair at a time versus I'm working on the back of a wig and I just need it to be full so I can go in and use like a seven because I'm just like chunking in larger pieces of hair. Um, if you do not label what your needles are, you will probably not be able to tell what they are. Um, I do not have a sharp enough eye to know. I didn't label this so I could not tell you probably um, without spending a lot of time what this needle is so definitely do a better job than me um, and label your spare needles so you know what they are. Um, so you will need a needle and then in order to actually use that needle you do need a holder for it. Um, oh and then one more quick note on needles too so it's again it's really hard to tell um, but this one is going to be one of the needles that's like a little bit more, um, I'll hold it up again, I don't think you can actually see anything. Um, this one is like a little bit straighter and it's more at an angle. So there's gonna be ones that are like that and then there's ones that are gonna be really, really curved. Um, I personally cannot use the curved ones. I learned on like the straighter angled needles. Um, 
the curved ones are just not ones that I can use. So if you are learning with one um, and you can't do it, it might be a good idea to get a hold of another kind of needle and see if you can use one of those. Because um, I remember in school, like I absolutely hated the curved needles. I got a bunch of those as a gift um, and I couldn't use them, but my teacher could. So I just gave them all to him um, and I just stuck with like the straighter, like angled ones. So there's certainly um, some people that are gonna be better suited to others. So definitely if you feel like you can't use one of them, um, don't totally give up on it because you might be able to use the other type. Um, and then so back to the holders. So as far as your holders go, usually you're going to be um, either working with something like this that's going to be more of like a plastic base holder. Um, these are the ones that I prefer. I don't like the ones that are longer than this. Um, or you're going to be working ones that are more of like a metal and they're usually a lot longer. Um, for me personally, again, this is just like trying to use like the curved needles. I just cannot use these. Um, this this one, at least the one I have, is a little bit heavier. Um, and I just feel like because it's a little bit longer, it's, it's just hard for me to use. Um, I do have very small hands, so I don't know if that has something to do with it, but um, this is an option. But then there are also these, and me personally, I think I just work better with this. Um, but again, that's what's something that you kind of have to figure out the more that you do this, is that um, yes, there are like certain basic supplies that you need, but there's also kind of ways to like customize it to what works better for you. So again, um, don't totally like give up on it if you hate one method, just because if you try like you know, like this with a curved needle, that might be exactly what you need. Um, so don't just give up because it's really, it is really hard when you first do it. Um, but basically what happens with these is you would take the needle and um, you would like drop it into here and then just tighten it down to what you need. Um, so I generally have like, I have like three of these like needle holders and then I have um, a range of different needles. I usually keep a couple of mine um, like ready to go, but I do also have it just kind of like separated like this. Um, I don't necessarily do a lot of like traveling with a lot of my wig stuff, so I'm not super concerned about it like getting damaged or anything. Um, but I do really recommend, um, I keep mine in like a little like plastic like, um, pencil case like that they have for like grade school kids usually. That's usually what I use. Um, and then I actually also keep mine because I'm really paranoid about breaking the needles. Um, because that is one thing that you do have to learn with ventilating is that the needles are very, very like very fine and very breakable. Um, if you drop it on the floor, you will probably break the barb off. And if you break off the barb, you can't use it anymore. Um, so it's something to kind of be careful of. And it is also very sharp too. So at the same time, it's like you're putting it into these like harder cases to protect the needle, but also to protect yourself. Um, I had a friend who got it stuck in their face before. I've dropped it and it got stuck in my leg before it like fell onto the ground. Um, Cause you have to think like, because it's these tiny little barbs, they're basically tiny fish hooks. Um, so it really can't get stuck in the skin. So just be really careful, store it carefully. Um, cause a lot of this stuff can be a little bit dangerous. Um, so like I showed you, I have mine in like a hard case. I also have it in like this tiny little, like, um, it's technically like a reusable lunch bag, but I also keep mine, um, in here too, just so that it's like extra protected. Um, but this is what it's like when it's all together. Um, and again, I have like two of these that I kind of keep ready to go at all times. I usually tell people like if they're trying to get into ventilating, um, I recommend getting like like a five or something like that to start as far as needle sizes just so that way it's not like the biggest needle in the world but it's also like small enough that like you can do detail work if you want to but it's not so small that you like can't grab any hair um because really you're going to learn that even if you have like a larger needle um you're going to be able to like kind of monitor how much hair you're grabbing the more you get used to it like I can use a five um like say this is a five like I can use that but I can only grab one piece of hair with it just because I've been able to like train myself to do that so you don't have to like necessarily drive yourself crazy in the beginning and get like the absolute smallest needle that there is um just because you're going to be able to find ways to just kind of make um one or two different sizes work for what you're doing um and again it's really important like always um store things carefully and you know, they're not necessarily like super expensive for all this stuff, but just like having it, I feel like having it in something like soft and padded like this, um, and then also having it in something like this, like a harder container like this, um, I don't know, it just makes me feel a lot better about it, and I feel like I can like put it in like my makeup case or my bag, um, and I can like take it to a job or something and I don't have to worry about it getting totally crushed, um, just because it's got like two different layers of protection, so I really do recommend um, finding a good container for it, um, just so that way you know your stuff is always safe. Um, it can be a little bit tricky to find these kinds of things. Um, if you are in Chicago, at least like one store we can buy, you can buy it at Krylon. Um, we sell all the like wig making supplies there. Otherwise, there are places online that you can buy them. Um, like Alcone sells some wig making stuff, Krylon sells some, um, Art of Wig sells some, I think like Manhattan Wardrobe Supply. And then there's a lot of like just like 
wig specific um, companies as well. It can be a little bit tricky to find this stuff, so that's why um, it is a good idea to do your best to take care of it. Um, other things that you're definitely going to need, so now you've got like your ventilating needle um, and you've got the holder for it, so you're going to need some kind of a wig block, right? So this is just kind of like a regular um, canvas wig block. Um, so these I like um, a lot. I don't, I've never worked on a wooden block, so you can either get blocks, um, in canvas or wood. I have never personally worked on a wooden one. To me, it seems like it would take a lot of, like, extra effort and work. Um, so I usually just stick with these canvas ones. Um, one thing you have to be careful of, though, is if the bottom of them is ever, like, damaged or not secured properly, sometimes the filling in it, so typically, like, sawdust, um, it can start to drain out, so you don't necessarily have to, like, throw them out because of that, but you may have to, like, tape around the bottom, um, just to make sure that it doesn't keep, like, draining out everywhere. Um, so that is something that you'd want to get. So that one, um, is made for wigs, but then they also make ones, um, for facial hair as well. So this one is a chin block, um, and again, this is canvas. Um, I don't like to work with the wooden ones, like I said, but, um, it's a good idea to have both of those. A chin block is something I got a lot more recently. Um, it's very easy, and that's something else I'll talk about too, um, in another video to, like, pat out a block. Um, if you don't have a chin block, but if you find yourself, like, making a lot of facial hair, um, it might be a good idea to invest in one. Um, and it's good too, I think, to have wig blocks in, like, a couple of sizes. Like, I try not to have them, like, super small, but I don't necessarily only want to have, like, huge ones. I try to find maybe, like, like a 22 inch. I don't know. I like to have that size just because I feel like it's more of, like, an average sized head. Um, and that way it's a little bit easier to, like, manipulate it. Um, obviously probably having some smaller is good too if you're constantly doing a ton of wig making. Um, I generally am just, um, doing more, like, facial hair pieces than anything else. I don't worry about it too much, but, um, you can certainly make, like, a wig block bigger if you have to when you pat it out, but you can't necessarily make them smaller. So that is something to kind of keep in mind if you are buying like a range of them. Um, they can get very expensive. Um, and sometimes too more expensive doesn't necessarily mean better. Like I've seen some expensive ones where I hate the shape of them. Um, wig blocks are going to come in a lot of different sizes, but generally you should be able to tell what the front of it is versus like the back of it. Um, so the front of it should be a little bit more like curved, um, than what the back of it is. Um, and so if we're going to look of this one that I have um, you can kind of see this one is like almost the same all the way around but the back does have slightly more curve to it than the front and that's how you kind of know um, which side is which definitely I have worked with some blocks that are not like that um, and it gets really confusing so sometimes you can actually just go ahead and like mark um, what is the front and what is the back um, or I just try to stay away from those um, and two I remember I worked somewhere once um, where we got like a shipment of wig blocks in and they were just like just I don't know if they were like defective or something but the shapes were just really off um so what you can do so this is not probably like the most recommended thing in the world but actually we like hit them against like a wall to get them to form back to like a normal shape so if they are ever a little bit misshapen sometimes you can do a little bit of work on them um to try to get them back to how they are but that's not necessarily something you should be doing all the time obviously be safe and careful if you're doing it um but it is something that i've done to canvas blocks um and then so the one I have and the one I'm showing that is just like a typical, like a short necked one. Um, but they do make really long neck ones too. Um, I don't have one of those yet, but those are great if you do a lot of like longer hairstyles. Um, those really come in handy because that way it's going to keep the hair kind of like from getting all over counters or something. And it just makes it a lot easier for you to work on. Um, and so once you've got your blocks, you've got your ventilating needles and everything, the next thing you have to get is lace. Um, so wig lace gets really confusing. There's bunch of different places that sell it um everybody kind of has their own different like names for it and especially now I think with how popular wigs are kind of getting there's even more lace out there um but really really generally speaking um you're gonna have lace that's meant for like the front of a wig and then lace that's meant for like a foundation of a wig there's about a million different things in between but that's kind of a good way to think about it is that you either have like a really fine like fronting lace um or you have a lace that's going to be a little bit sturdier that's going to help make up like the foundation um or essentially like the back of your wig um so as far as wig lace goes um the one that i typically work with so i usually use stuff from krylon um that is obviously not the only place that has it but um I do work there so it's more easily accessible and so we have um a lace there called film lace so this is one thing to kind of like think about too is that different companies are going to call things different things so we call this lace film lace um but I personally and other like wig makers they talk to you don't really feel that it's as fine as film laces it's more of just like a fronting lace um 
So something that is like a film lace is usually really, really, really fine. So that way it's like very undetectable um, when it's on stage. So that's one thing um, that you're going to find like as you work and as you do your wig making is that um, every company kind of has their own name for things. So you're going to eventually figure out um, like which brands and which types you like to use better than others. Um, so really quick, just to kind of get an idea of um, how it's sold. So we usually sell it by the yard. Um, if you're working at like a big like wig shop or something, they might be selling like bolts of it. Um, but I typically will sell it by like the yard or like the half yard. Um, and it's just like comes like this um, and basically this is what so this is the same thing that you saw that was on um, the front of the wig that I have so it'll just come like this um, and you can see it's pretty stretchy so that way it's gonna help kind of like move with the person um, it can be pretty expensive I believe this is around like $70 or $75 a yard um, so it's not necessarily the cheapest thing in the world but um, unless you are making like giant full wigs all the time, you really will have this for a long time. Like if you're just making a lot of like smaller facial hair pieces, um, which is what I'm typically doing, um, a yard of lace is going to last you a long time. So it's definitely an investment um, to start getting all of this stuff, but it's not necessarily um, something that you're going to have to invest in like every other week um, unless you're making tons and tons of wigs. Um, and then, so once you've got your lace figured out um, and you've got your needles, the next thing you kind of want to think of is the hair that you're going to get. So really generally speaking, because again too, there's kind of not necessarily like as many different kinds of hair as there are like wig lace, um, but really generally speaking, you're either going to have human hair or you're going to have synthetic hair um, or yak hair usually. So there's a couple other things that you could have in between there, but very basically speaking, um, those are the three things that you're probably most commonly going to see um, in wig shops and when you're doing wig making. Um, so human hair is obviously going to be hair that comes from um, a human head. Um, so this kind of hair is usually going to be a lot more expensive than the synthetic hair that you're finding. Um, and this is also going to be not necessarily always like one of the easiest things to work with, um, but it kind of gives you probably the most freedom to work with it because you can work with it the same way you would work with actual human hair. So because it is actual human hair, you can heat style it, whereas if you're using synthetic hair, which is actually just a plastic, um, you cannot put heat on that without melting it. So they do make some um, synthetic hair now that is heat resistant. I get really nervous with it. I personally still really try not to use any heat on it, even if it says it can withstand a certain amount. Um, they make like synthetic hair curling irons and like all kinds of things now, but I still get really nervous um, that I'm going to melt it. So if you are ever working with like supposedly like um, heat safe synthetic hair, always test like a small part of it, like cut some of it off and just like usually I'll like wrap it around like a curling iron and you'll know like right away because it will just scorch it or it will just completely like melt down. Um, and if that is the case, do not use heat on it. Um, if you put heat on a synthetic wig, trying to restyle it after that, and I have had to do this after someone else has styled wigs, it is a nightmare and it's really hard to ever get it back um, to what it used to be. So just be really careful, always test your hair um, because a lot of times too, one thing that you're gonna find, and especially if you are shopping for hair online, make sure that you are always, and same with like wigs too, uh, make sure you always read through, not necessarily like the ingredient list for it, but like read through like exactly what it is because they will label things as like um, human hair. They'll say it's like, oh, it's 100% human hair, but then you read it and it's actually like human hair blend or like maybe there's like three human hairs in it and the rest of it's synthetic. So they really try. Um, to word things in ways to make it seem like you are getting um, human hair when you may not be. So don't necessarily think um, that just because like something looks like it might be a great deal on human hair, sometimes it is like too good to be true. It's not always going to be like that, um, but be really careful um, just because you never know um, just how synthetic something might be. So I always test something, um, unless it's like a really, really like trusted hair source, um, I would probably test almost like everything, especially if you are buying it offline and you're not like there looking at it in person, um, just because you never wanna melt something when you get like all the way done ventilating and then you like go and curl something and it just completely melts it. Um, so be really careful with that stuff. Um, as far as like why you might want to ventilate um, with one versus the other, um, synthetic hair can get a little bit tricky um, when you are ventilating because sometimes I think um, that it kind of like fights you a little bit more and it doesn't like to lay as flat sometimes as human hair does. But what's nice is that um, it's a little bit of like a sturdier hair. So if you are like working at like an outdoor theater um, or just working somewhere where it's generally like a more humid and like hotter climate or they're um, performing and under like really strenuous activities like they're in a musical and they're dancing um, synthetic hair is gonna 
kind of hold style a little bit better. Whereas a like human hair, we all know um, that if you curl your hair and you like sweat, you're gonna sweat it out. Um, so that might make you have to style it a little bit more. So it just kind of depends um, what situation you're in and also what your budget is because synthetic hair is generally gonna be cheaper. Um, it's gonna come in like a wider like range of like colors usually that aren't gonna be quite as expensive um, as getting like a human hair that could be very expensive. But um, me personally, if I can ventilate with human hair, I would always prefer to do that. But um, synthetic hair is totally fine. Um, if you are working on facial hair, yak hair can be really great too. Um, I've never used yak hair personally for like a wig, um, but I have used it for facial hair. Um, a lot of it comes in like a very pure white, which is really hard to find in human hair um, and can also get really expensive in human hair, so it can be like a good option for that. Um, so you just know it's like you've got a few different options, but really generally speaking, um, things that are commercially available, you're probably going to be working more with either like a human or a synthetic hair. Um, and then ways to kind of like store that hair. So um, there's a couple different ways to do it. So I have, um, for a project I'm working on now, this is not necessarily the best way to do it, but I've got like the two pieces. So this is part that I just like completely like cut out of um, a synthetic wig that I'm using. And then here's some other synthetic hair um, that I'm like repairing the front on a wig. Um, so I just have mine hanging out like this. What's important about the way that I do have it though is that way I'm always aware um, of what the root of it is and what the end of it is. Um, with human hair that's really important because if you kind of like flip flop it um, and when you're doing it if like the root of it ends up on like the bottom it's definitely not going to lie flat when you're knotting. Um, so you have to be careful with that. Um, this will at least like kind of help you stay organized but it's not necessarily the best way to transport it. Something that can actually be really helpful um, is using a drawing card. Um, so this is how drawing cards come. They are basically like, kind of like, they look like a tiny bed of nails. Um, and you would put the hair inside of this and kind of like sandwich it in it. And then it kind of lays flat in there and you're able to either like mix and like blend hair sort of in here. Like you can lay them on top of each other um, instead of having to like mix it by hand. Um, and it's really nice because you can just kind of like pull the hair back out. Um, so that is one thing. Those are a little bit expensive. Um, obviously I have them, but I'm not currently using it, but it is a good thing um, to use. Again, I don't like travel around with all my wig stuff that often, but if I did, um, that would be a really great thing to use. Um, another thing that is not necessarily like 100% necessary for wig making, um, but if you're really like working a lot on wigs, I think too, especially with like facial hair, when you're trying to like blend a lot of colors together, it can get hard to do it all by hand. Um, so one way you can do that was with a hackle. Um, so I do have a hackle. Hackles are very dangerous in my opinion because they are literally and you will see when I get it out um, It's literally like a bed of nails um, Except like there's no cover over it like the drawing cards. It is just like metal with nails sticking out um, I don't know if someone has invented a cover for it. I had this discussion with like another artist before I don't know why they don't come with covers um, But if you have it, I recommend like store it very safely. Mine is literally like in a box um, wrapped in bubble wrap because it is it is very scary and you can get hurt very easily um so I'm gonna grab that and just kind of show you um so you can see like you literally have it in a box um because I am very scared of it um and so something else that comes with hackles too so you'll see in a second so hackles always need to be um clamped down so if you don't have like a little c-clamp to clamp it down please don't use it it has to be clamped down to a table because if you basically with hackles you have like this metal and you are just kind of like pushing hair into it and pulling it back out. If you do that too forcefully and it's not stuck down to anything, it's just, it could fall off and it could really hurt you. Um, so you can see, so I even have it, um, I'm very cautious with everything, but I have it wrapped in bubble wrap too. But you can see that this thing, it's pretty serious. Um, it is pretty scary. It does a great job of mixing and blending hair. Not something I use very often. Um, but again, I do have one, but you need to be really careful if you do ever get these. Um, and it is imperative. Um, that you properly have it stored and properly have it clamped down to a table. Um, and like I said, if you don't have clamps for it, don't even consider using it because you could really, really hurt somebody um, and hurt yourself too. Um, so be really careful with that kind of stuff, but I did want you to at least kind of see um, what that was. I think it's probably something you might find more commonly in like special effects shops um, than anything else, but um, it's fun. I think they're fun to use. You just have to make sure you're safe with it. Um, and then really like the only other things you would need, you would need like some straight pins um, or like some smaller like silver, like I call them like facial hair pins, but just like smaller silver pins um, to pin down facial hair since it's usually a little bit smaller. Um, I like to work with the hair when it's wet when I'm ventilating. 
Um, and then otherwise, like the most important things um, to remember when you're ventilating is that you need to kind of like get up and take breaks. You need to have good posture when you're doing it. You need good lighting. Um, those are all things that I'm not necessarily the best about when I am personally doing it, but really if you are sitting there um, for eight hours and you do not get up and you do not have good lighting, um, your body is going to hate you, your eyes are going to hate you, and it is just really important to get up and walk away from it. Um, even if you're enjoying it and you're having a good time, you have to walk away because you could end up with like really bad muscle cramps um, and it can just get really painful after a while. So you just want to make sure, um, like obviously it's important to get your work done, but it's also important to do it safely. Um, and then I'm going to do a whole separate uh, video on like ventilating. Um, but just like really quickly with that, you're basically going to either be doing like a single knot or like a double knot with it. Um, if you're doing a single knot, that's what you're most of the time going to be doing in like the front of the wig and for most... Um, most parts of wigs, most of the time when I'm doing facial hair and stuff, I'm just doing single knots, um, which just means that you're just going through and knotting at once, but then there's going to be other times when you do double knots, um, and double knots are usually to just kind of add like a little bit more like um, security and to make like a stronger knot, so a lot of times you'll use that kind of like um, in areas where like like the nape of the neck where like this part might be like rubbing a lot um, onto somebody's skin so that might like untie the knots so you will double knot it in order to kind of keep that a little bit more secure and then you may also use it to just kind of like um, join two layers of lace together too um, again we're gonna get more into that in a separate video um, but really basically that's kind of everything you might need um, as far as like a little like intro kit into wig making goes. Another thing I can really recommend, um, and I talk about this book 24-7, really, um, this wig making and styling um, book by Martha Ruskai and Allison Lowry is probably going to be your best friend. Um, I have told a million people about this, I've talked about it in other videos too, but really this book, um, it is the best resource that I have found as far as like having something on hand because it can be really hard to like sit down and like read about ventilating and wig stuff but um, you're gonna have moments where you just like you need to see it and you need to like see photos and you need to see it written down and just having that book has helped me so much on jobs um, because as soon as you leave school um, you don't have like your teacher you don't have all the resources in your classroom anymore right so it's really nice um, to just have something on hand so if you're looking for um, a good source for all this and you're looking for something to help you kind of like get through all this I really do recommend that book um, otherwise obviously there's lots of videos and everything on there but I do think uh, it is a good idea to always have some kind of a solid source like that um, but hopefully wig making makes a little bit more sense and you kind of have a good idea of what you might need for a basic wig making kit